So, welcome to uh, lecture number 6 of this module 6. Uh, in the previous lecture, we saw that uh, uh, various uh, modeling aspect of AC and DC systems and uh, we derived the various uh, differential equations for the different uh, blocks, different models and that should be solved. So, in this lecture, I will slightly, uh, lightly I will just review the integration techniques that will be used to solve those differential equation, then I will move on the dynamic stability analysis. So, uh, to solve the, the any differential equations, there are the two type of methods are existing. One is the explicit method and other is the implicit method. So, in the explicit methods, the Ehlers method as well as the modified Ehlers method, Ranga Kutta methods and so many other methods are proposed by the different uh, uh, scientists and the mathematicians. So, uh, let us see what is the Ehlers method. So, in suppose you want to solve this is a differential equation d y upon d t is equal to f y t and this is a function differential function with respect to y and t uh, this is a differential function with respect to t. This can be solved by the Ehlers method. So, at any step that is a n plus 1 th time step having the length h that can be written here y is equal to n plus 1 time it will be equal to y n th plus d y upon d here d t and this value should be evaluated at here this d y by d t you can see this function here if we want to put at y n time. So, this is a y n here multiplied by the h. So, this is your solution and then it can be progressively it is moving starting from n is equal to 0 to n is equal to larger value and then we can get the function tracing with respect to time. So, this we can plot the function with respect to time, time step length that is a h and then the different value of y axis that value we can get from this Ehlers method. Another here uh, in this there is a method there is a lot of problems then the modified Ehlers method was proposed and this is also known as the predictor and corrector method sometimes. What here it is a slight modification instead of the second term of the first Ehlers method is now replaced by the two terms. One is the same that is the d y upon d t at nth instant plus d y upon d t plus n plus one th instant. So, this what we are doing here we are just calculating these two and then divide taking average multiplied by s. So, this term here the third term now we can say that is replaced and instead of this first term second term here. So, we are having the two terms. So, here this is the average of this is n th plus n plus n th term and that is a calculated here. Another very popular method that is called Ranga Kutta methods for the solving the differential equations whether it is a linear or non-linear differential equation for it is a both for it is valid. So, this you can see this is a equation just if you want to calculate uh, the value of uh, y at n plus 1 th stand that will be equal to y n plus there is a term here of the various k's that is a k 1, k 2, k 3 and k 4 that is having a sum here the k 1 plus 2, k 2 plus 2, k 3 plus k 4 is a sum together then we are multiplying by h and that is a divided by 6. These values are basically calculated and it was given by the Ranga Kutta method. The k 1 is a nothing but it is the function value this uh, function value which is uh, just you can see this is a function value here and that value is basically at here nth instant. So, this y n t n value this will give you the k 1. k 2 is calculated using the k 1 function. The k 1 value once you have calculated now you are again this is a function that same function y t where we are putting this value this y n plus modified by uh, h plus 2 k 1 and then we are adding the t n plus h by 2 that is the h is the step length. Similarly, the k 3 is using your k 2 and the k 4 is using k 3 and this is a progressively. So, all these constants are calculated and then they are put in this equation and then you can get this y n s plus n. So, there is a various order here is a fourth order because you are getting the fourth k constants already 2 and 3 order also differential equation solutions of Ranga Kutta methods are available, but this is very widely used third and fourth order Ranga Kutta methods. Another here method is that is called predictor and corrector method here in one step we predict and second step we cut. So, in the predictor step what we do we just calculate the value of y that is predict the value at n plus 1 th instant and here that is why the p is denoted that is showing that it is a predicted value that will be equal to the corrected value obtained in the previous step and the previous step is nothing but your this nth step before because the n plus n n plus 1th step you are calculating. So, previous is your y nth 
value, uh, step the value and this is a C showing the corrected value that we are using plus d y upon d t and this value is evaluated at this uh, y is equal to y n c this is a corrected value that we are calculating multiplied by h. So, this is your predicting, but here this prediction must be corrected because there is some error and that is a correction here that we are getting the n plus 1 th corrected that is the final value will be equal to the corrected value of nth instant plus half of this two value one is the before the corrected step and another we are using at the predicted step because y n plus 1 predicted because this c value is not known because we are going to calculate here. So, this is average of the uh, value of d y upon d t at the nth corrected value plus the d y by d t at the y plus nth predicted value that should be average out and then it is multiplied by h that will give you this nth plus 1 instant the corrected value of your y. There are some other methods as well and uh, that is a uh, higher order methods sometimes Admas base forth method, Milne methods, Hamming methods etcetera that are also proposed and that has been used for the various even applications. Another is the very widely used that is the implicit method here in this it is called the trapezoidal integration method and this is also known as the implicit method. Here what we do we use the trapezoidal rule of integration means you can see that is the value here the y n plus at the instant n plus 1 at the instant will be equal to y n plus this is the here if you can say this is the area of the trapezoidal that can be understood by the see this if this is a curve which is a dy by dt and this is the time step you can see the function value here this we are talking the function the function at the t n it is we are getting f n t n and um, t plus n 1 of the strength we are getting this. So, what we are doing we are just linearizing this and you can see this whole this is a trapezoidal. So, if you want to calculate the area of this uh, trapezoidal what will happen this is here the multiplied by this and the average of this side you can say right hand side and the left hand side then you can take average it by 2 and then multiply it by s. So, you can say this value means we are taking this height that is from here to here and then we are here this second term we are adding and then we are taking by 2 multiplied by s that is this trapezoidal. So, this is a trapezoidal concept we are linearizing because we are assuming this h is very small. So, that can be taken as a linear function even though its function is non linear, but this we can make this is a linear that is why it becomes a trapezoidal. So, this is also very widely used, but it has a some limitations. So, the people go for the Ranga Kutta and other methods because this method sometimes gives a non convergent solution. So, these methods are basically can be used for the solving the differential equations and then we can predict the stability of the system that is the transient stability. Now, I have to come on the another the main topic of this lecture that is the stability of a dynamic system here we are going to discuss that is what is the dynamic stability of a system. To begin with let us see the stability again to just uh, revise the stability of a linear system is entirely dependent on the input because it is not dependent on uh, its uh, initial state and uh, what is this uh, other values, but it depends upon the input the state uh, uh, of a stable system with the zero input will always return to the origin of the state space independent of the finite initial state. So, here for the linear system you can know these two bullets are showing for the linear system because the linear system the stability is directly related to the input. It is not related to the initial as well as the system here as well. So, you can see in the linear system if your input is 0 then always it will return to its original value and it is that is the independent of its initial state where it is lying. However, for this nonlinear systems which uh, depends on the type and magnitude of input because it depends upon magnitude as well as the type and also at the initial condition. So, these three are the governing criteria which decide the stability of a nonlinear system. Since the power system including HVDC system is highly nonlinear, so that we have to see this we have to take the nonlinear system as well. So, the classification of stability of nonlinear system can be classified in the three terms one is called the local stability or the stability in a small or it is known as another is the finite stability third one is the global stability or stability in the large. So, a system is said to be locally stable about an equilibrium point if when subjected to a small perturbation 
it remains in a small region surrounding the equilibrium point, it can be studied by linearizing the nonlinear system. What does it mean? It is meaning that uh, if you are having the your uh, equilibrium point and the equilibrium point you can see from here, that is if you are having the equilibrium point here and then what happens your this system can lie with around the equilibrium point, then we can say it is a locally stable. It is not after putting some input or doing some disturbance, if it is deviating from here from other equilibrium point and this region it is fine coming here. So, that is why it is said the system is said to be locally stable about an equilibrium point if subjected to small perturbation, it remains to a small region surrounding the equilibrium point. It can be studied by the linearizing the system. So, nonlinear system must be linearized to see the local stability, linearize and then it should be studied and that we will see in this lecture. If and another way is a finite, uh, finite uh, stability that is also defined in the another way. If a state of a system remains within a finite region R, it is said to be the stable within the region R. If the state of the system returns to the original equilibrium point from any point within R, it is asymptotically stable within the finite region. So, this is now we are talking about this is a region R. So, it is stable in this and if you are it is uh, it is coming to the original equilibrium point, then it is called the asymptotically stable. A system is said to be globally stable if all R which includes the entire space space. So, it is can say the globally stable for any region. So, region so R should be very large and the finite space entire. So, this is called globally stable. To analyze the stability of the system, here uh, uh, this Lyapunov's uh, first stability methods that is called the Lyapunov's first method. In this, the stability in the small of a nonlinear system is given by the roots of the correct equation of the linearized system that is basically nothing but the eigenvalues of E that is the state transition matrix. So, by looking the eigenvalues, first you have a nonlinear differential equations, you are linearizing and then you are getting the state space representation where A is your state matrix and then if you are calculating the eigenvalue of A and based on that eigenvalues, you can derive a lot of observations and those observations will tell that whether your system is stable or not stable. For example, if you are having this eigenvalues, means your all eigenvalues are having the negative real parts then we can say your original system is asymptotically stable. If all the eigenvalues are having the negative uh, real parts, we are only talking about the real parts not about the imaginary parts. Second condition is that when at least one of the eigenvalue has a positive real, then original system is unstable. So, what happens if you are having its eigenvalue here, I can say this omega plus j here omega, uh, sigma omega this uh, j omega, here we are talking if this value is your negative, then all it is negative, it is non-zero we are talking, negative means negative. So, it is negative, then it is stable. If positive at least 1, then it is unstable and if it is 0, because it can be positive, it can be negative or it can be 0 as well, then for the 0, you can see when eigenvalues have a real part equal to 0 it is not possible to say anything on the first approximation. So, we cannot say whether the system is stable or unstable, it is maybe oscillatory, it will be uh, stable or unstable. So, this we are having the three criteria based on the eigenvalue. This is we are having a large number of eigenvalue, it depends upon what is the size of A. If you are having this A matrix here, this can be your n cross n matrix, then you are having this is I here is having the n values and then we can see for all the eigenvalues we are talking. So, this is the case for the stability in the small means that is the dynamic stability because we are the non-linear system is just treated as a linearized, uh, linearized system where we are linearizing around the equilibrium point and then we are trying to get the information of the eigenvalues. The stability uh, in the large may be studied by explicitly solution of non-differential equations and that is why we went for the transient stability analysis. So, just I were talking here the stability in the large may be studied by the solution of the non-linear differential equations. So, we have to use the differential equations, we have to model all the components of ACDC systems and then we have to use the 
solution techniques for the solving these differential equation and then we can get the stability in, in the large by solving those and we can see the pattern whether the system is stable or unstable. So, the, this the stability in the small is related to your dynamic stability means we are the nonlinear system is the linearized and then we are trying to get the eigenvalues and based on that we are predicting whether the system is stable or not stable. So, this is a Lyapunov's first method. Lyapunov's second method are also it is known as the direct method. Here it does not require any explicit solution of the differential equations. It is based on the using a function and it is the sign along with the derivative of the function and it is the sign. So, we, we can form a function v that is called the Lyapunov function and then we can see the function nature along with the sign. Then we can differentiate this function and then we can see the sign then this will give the information about your the nonlinear differential equations that is without solving this equation. So, what happens that in this uh, the equilibrium of a system is stable we can say the equilibrium of system is stable if there exists a positive definite function v. So, we should be very clear about what is the positive definite function, what is the semi definite positive function all and what is the negative definite etcetera it should be clear. So, the function v which is having this x 1 to x n states. So, these are having the n state system because we are having a matrix that is having states n cross n, a matrix is n cross n means we are having x here I can say this x, this matrix, uh, this variable it is having one, uh, uh, this n cross 1 elements means it is having n elements x 1 to x n such that it is the total derivative with respect to the system is non positive. So, it is a stable if it is a non positive means you can be very careful non positive means it will be negative or it can be 0, but it should not be positive. So, the system will be said to be the stable if there exists a positive difference function v such that the total derivative with respect to system is non positive. We can also further categorize this equilibrium of system is asymptotically stable if there exists a positive definite function v of x 1 to x n such that it is a total derivative with respect to system is negative definite means it is not 0, it is not positive, it is always negative then we can say the system is asymptotically stable. Also the system is stable in that region in which the derivative of v is negative semi definite and the asymptotically stable if the derivative of v is the negative definite. So, if it is a negative then we can say it is asymptotic, if it is a negative semi, semi definite then it is called you are the stable in that region. So, these are the three criteria derived from the Lyapunov second methods or direct methods. So, here there is no need to solve the differential equation, we can form the function that it is called Lyapunov's function and then we can see it is a derivative of this function and along with this function itself we can conclude about the stability of the system, but however we cannot form we cannot predict about the relative stability etcetera. So, now this uh, as this lecture is dedicated for the small signal or dynamic uh, stability of the system. So, it is a ability let us define what is this, it is the ability of the power system network to maintain the synchronous when subjected to small disturbances. If you are talking about the large disturbance then it becomes the transient stability and in that case the linearized system will not work you have to solve the differential equation or you can use the Lyapunov's methods the second method to check whether the system is sta uh, stable or not. So, since the disturbance is small, so it utilizes basically the linearized analysis of the dynamical system around an equilibrium operating point. So, we can linearize the nonlinear equations around the equilibrium point and then we can go for this analysis. So, to see this fundamental concept this a dynamical system can be described by the set of first order differential equation here you can say x dot is equal to f x u this. So, this is the function here and this may be a nonlinear function and then you can say it is a in a state space form we can go for this here this is a for autonomous function this here t is a means a not a wiring, so t is not there. So, for autonomous system I can say x dot is equal to a function of x and u, x is your state of the system and u is your the input of the system. Along with your output equation that is y is your output that is uh, governed by another equation another function I can say it is a g which is also a function of x and u. So, here x is the states of the system and u is the input. So, the, we are having the output this is y, these 
uh, you can say that is why here it is written where x is the having x 1 to x n, uh, it is assumed that is the, there are n states variables and then output is having the mth output variables and u is the control variable vectors. So, at equilibrium point or your singular point, this x dot at the steady state point what happens x dot is equal to 0 means it is not varying with the time. So, this function x naught that will be equal to 0 here. For a small disturbance resulting in the change in the variables, then what will happen? Your the states will change from x to another state. So, the change I can say the del x, there is a change in output that is called del y and if there is a change in the input that is the del u, the system equation can be written in the Lyrenreich form. So, your this equation, this first equation here and the two can be written here in this form that is the change in x dot is equal to a multiplied by change in the x plus c multiplied by change in your input vector and your output change will be equal to O matrix multiplied by del x plus f n into del u. So, these two equations are basically the now linearized state space equations where a is defined as the change in the function with respect to x and your c is a change in your function f with respect to input. However, your u uh, o and f are the change in the g function with respect to x and your change in the g function derivative of the g function with respect to u respectively. So, all the derivatives are calculated at the initial equilibrium points and here also this a c o f matrices are known as a is known as the state or plant matrix. It is also called the state transition matrix in some books. C is known as the control or input matrix. O is called your output matrix. F is known as the feed forward matrix. So, we are having all these four matrices means that is A, C and O, F they are basically forming the linearized equation. Now, it can be now we can as after linearizing this, now we can see the behavior of the system by nothing but we can see the character equation and that is the roots of the character equation will be basically giving the information. So, the it can be shown that the closed loop poles of the above system are roots of the character equation and the root of character equation here you can say the determinant of S that is the S is the Laplace operator multiplied by your identity matrix minus A that is A transition matrix is equal to 0. So, if you can solve this means these roots are called the eigenvalues of the state matrix S and this will be having the S will have equal to your the eigenvalues. So, the eigenvalues here now I can replace here this earlier I use S, now we can use the lambda, the lambda is nothing but these are the eigenvalues and since your A matrix is having the size of n cross n, so it will be having your n eigenvalues. So, that is why you can see here the lambda is equal to lambda 1, lambda 2 to lambda n and these are the basically this of state matrix A can be obtained by finding the roots of the correct equation here A minus lambda i. So, so lambda that is if we can get here after solving this. So, we can get the A minus lambda i. Also, if you will see then the previous equation I use the S i minus A both are having same means you are having a minus lambda i and you are getting the determinant that will be equal to the determinant of lambda i minus a because this is your and that is really equal to 0 and we are solving this equation. So, it will not change. So, by looking at the eigenvalues and the lambda i as I said the i will be here n in number because we have taken a of size n cross n. So, that can be written here alpha i plus minus j omega i which are given by the roots of correct equations system state matrix said following conclusion on the small signal stability can be drawn. Here even though in the previous uh, just I wrote here this sigma here we can also write here some in book you will find here alpha. So, for this here we can say this alpha i here omega i and this you will have always if you are having uh, this imaginary part as well of the eigenvalue. So, it will always be in the complex conjugate. So, you are having this I can say if you are having the plus you will have the minus as well if you are having the imaginary part. However, if you are not having imaginary part, so it can be having distance or it can be the same. So, that depends upon here and there on the system and as you call say the values. So, 
here in general I can say this lambda that is eigenvalue for the ith eigenvalue will be equal to your alpha i plus minus j omega i and based on that we can draw the final following information. You can see here all these three informations are almost same as the Lyapunov first stability criteria. So, they, you can see here again I have written here when all the eigenvalues have the negative real parts the system is asymptotically stable. I want to say that if all these here alphas here alpha will be the negative none of them even the 0 we are talking the negative. So, all this here value will have the value and it will be negative then we can say the system is asymptotically stable. If at least one eigenvalue has the positive real part then original system will be unstable means at least suppose there is a n eigenvalue even the one eigenvalue is having positive then no need to see the other one then system will be automatically unstable. When all the eigenvalues have the negative real part except one complex pair having the purely imaginary means at least you are having here one 0 here this means you are having the two eigenvalues that is one you can say lambda 1 will be your j omega i and another your lambda 2 is your j minus j omega i. So, you are having the two eigenvalues means they are the purely imaginary then system will exhibit the oscillation. For second order uh, system you can see this lambda that we can write here in terms of damping factor. You can see here the lambda again I have written alpha is equal to plus minus j omega that can be represented by this another slightly uh, deviated here omega I have written omega n under root 1 minus zeta square and this alpha is defined at the zeta omega n. Why it is written because this zeta is known as your the damping ratio and this gives the very good information because the damping ratio determines the rate of decay of your amplitude of oscillations. If there is any oscillation, so this decide is that what is the damping factor. If damping factor is higher, so it will be damp out easily and if damping is factor is less, then it will be damping after long time. Omega n which is the natural or undamped frequency of oscillations and omega is called the damped frequency of oscillations and the zeta is defined as in terms of real as well as the imaginary values of your eigenvalues. You can say the zeta is equal to minus of alpha that is the real part of the eigenvalue divided by the square of uh, under root uh, uh, square root of the square of alpha square plus omega square and then it is giving your zeta. So, the, this zeta so you can see if you are having this eigenvalue is having the complex conjugate then you can have all these things you can represent in terms of zeta. Now, if you are here you can see the omega is 0 then you are having only the real part of the eigenvalues and you can see if this is your omega is 0 you are having the zeta is your is unity and that is minus 1. So, the damping factor is 100 percent. So, there is no oscillation, but if you are having some value here then it will have the less and based on that it will be the deciding factor. So, normally some of the differential equations are represented instead of here uh, as a sorry uh, as here this were equations the real and imaginary part it is also equally important to represent this eigenvalues in terms of the damping ratio and that also gives a lot of information about how system is your damped or critically damped or under damped that will give the information. So, now another uh, first thing we saw the eigenvalues based on the eigenvalues we decide that your system is stable or unstable. Now, that is not only sufficient because knowing only your system is stable is we are happy if system is unstable then the question arises what to do or if your system is stable very closely we want to make more and more stable we want to design a system to have a very robust system then we require some more information we require some more information that what states are creating the problem in the system and those states must be identified and then we can devise we can go further some new controller to improve the system stability. So, the Eigen vectors are uh, one tool based on the Eigen vectors we can and of course, later on we will see the participation factors using this Eigen vectors we can derive or we can just devise some control mechanism and we can see which of the states are participating much or less in any control modes. 
So, that is a required and to have this let us go for this eigenvectors first. So, there are the two eigenvectors one is called the right eigenvector another is called the left eigenvector. So, REV and LEVs are the vectors and based on that we can form some matrix this vector matrix we can say left eigen mat vector matrix and then we can say the right eigen vector matrix and these information are used to calculate the participation factor. Now, let us, uh, first uh, let us see what is the, your uh, uh, right eigen vectors that is REV and this is denoted by the phi and it is nothing but it is a n column vector associated with the an eigen values lambda i and which must satisfy the condition E a phi i is equal to lambda i and here it should be also phi I think there is some mistake here. So, what we can do here we can this is a defined if you know this is we are having this x dot what we are writing this change in x dot here x plus b u change in your this. Now, we can write this is your a matrix here that is has the lambda and now since you are writing this right. So, it is your phi i is equal to here phi i here we are writing. So, now this is a vector we are writing and this is a corresponding to one eigen value that is i. Mind it here this is a vector, this is a matrix, this is a scalar value and this is a matrix 2. So, this your a here it is n cross n matrix, here this is your n cross 1 as I said is a vector, here this is a scalar and this is again your n cross 1. So, you can say this is a balance and this is a satisfactory equation. Now, we can see this phi here we can also write this phi i is nothing but we are having the vector of n 1. So, I can write phi i 1 phi i 2 2 to here phi i n means we are having n values for this one uh, this phi matrix uh, phi vector itself. So, we are getting n. So, we can solve and since you can say this is a right. So, that is why it is called this here this R e v right eigen vector because you can say this vector we are multiplying the right hand side of this equation. So, this value we can determine we can solve by this equation. Only I just I want to emphasize here that this phi the equations we are getting because here for so we are getting this n equations because here we have the n values are there. So, you are having the n equations for one eigen value. So, in this the so many uh, equations are de uh, in, in de uh, dependent on each other. So, what happens it your phi matrix uh, phi vector here is not a unique. So, you can put one value and based on that you can calculate. So, you can have the different vectors, but it has a special property and that we will see later on. So, we can calculate here because you cannot directly solve it here you can have the choose the one value then second or etcetera that you can calculate and you are having n equations and you can get your this phi. So, here I want to emphasize that this phi i this vector is not unique you can have the set of phi i and but again the property wise will find the same given the information. Now, as I said here this lambda i this you are calculating for i -th. similarly since you are having the n lambda. So, you are having n this phi is. So, then if you can arrange in a such a way that you can say this is your phi here I can say this is a matrix then this is nothing but you are putting here the phi 1 to here your phi n. So, all this here only this you can say phi i is also there and that is I put it here. So, you are having this matrix now becomes n class n and it is known as the right eigen vector matrix and this is one matrix of a full matrix. So, this is going to give another information and we will see how it is going to be utilized. Bef before this let us go for the another um, vector that is called your left eigen vector and this is uh, represented by your psi and this is a n row vector earlier it was as you can say it is a column vector and that is your row vector associated with the eigen value here the eigen value lambda i that must satisfy the condition here you can see this here. So, left eigen vector just now I am explaining as I said it is a row matrix and it is denoted normally by the psi i why it is uh, called this uh, left eigen vector because again we are writing here a e psi i is equal to your lambda uh, so psi i here lambda i. Now, you can see this is your 1 cross 1 cross n 
and this is your we are having n cross n so this multiplication exists so we are going to have this 1 cross n and this is already we are having 1 cross n and this is your scalar so in this case we are going to have this phi psi i this is your nothing but psi i 1 to here psi i n means i want to tell you that we for a single link again the lambda i again the lambdas are we are having n because this matrix is having n cross n so we are having n eigenvalues and then correspondingly we can for i -th, we can write this so we can again using all this we can have uh, this matrix now we can have all these values here corresponding to 1 so this is your psi 1 here you are having psi 2 and similarly here you can have psi n and these are matrices that we are writing in the vector so this completely we are writing this or you can write in the transpose form and this becomes a matrix now in this case also as I said here some of the here since you are having the n equations here and these equations must be solved for the different value of psi i you will find some of the equations here are independent to each other means you cannot uniquely have the solution then by putting some value you can get some other values so this matrix or this elements are also not unique but after getting that you are having a matrix this your that is your left eigenvector matrix as well as your right eigenvector matrix they are having a unique property and in the normalized form if you are multiplying these two you are going to have the identity matrix and that you can say here if you are having this so because this matrix here phi will be equal to your phi psi here and that will be equal to unit identity matrix so this is a normalized form here you can already i have also written here the matrix uh, are orthogonal so that's why this multiplication is becomes identity so these two matrices are basically orthogonal matrices and it is said to be normalized if they are having this identity matrix otherwise this i will be not there it will be your diagonal matrix having the some constants. Now let us see the participation factor because the participation factor is calculated this participation factor the pki are determined as the you can say the multiplication of your left eigen eigen vector the values of the k -th multiplied by the psi i that is where the phi i k is the element of k -th row and the i -th column of the right eigen vector matrix that is nothing but the k -th entry of your this right eigen vectors phi i the k i basically what the, this phi k i measures the activity of x k in the k -th mode x k means x -th k -th means so just we can say this x is a state as i said in the beginning here we are having the x this is nothing but your x1 to your we are having xn so here we are talking x k -th. so this k -th here the activity it measures the activity of the k -th state in the i -th mode similarly this uh, psi i k is the element of i -th row and the k -th element of left eigen vector matrix the kth entry of this matrix and this basically what does it weighs the contribution of the activity of the kth state in the ith mode so this weighs the contribution and this may weigh, this measures the activity based on these two it gives the pki that is the participation factor is a measure of a relative participation in the kth state variable xk in the ith modes of oscillation why we are talking the ith modes of oscillation because this ith modes of oscillation will be decided by its ith eigenvalue this eigenvalue will have your real and imaginary part and then we can say this what is the relative participation of this in this oscillation so based on that here this is the element that we are calculating we can form the participation matrix that is the defined as the p it is having the all the p1 to pn and this pi is basically nothing but it is a calculated from here so you can say k1 k2 for all the states we can have the participation matrix so we can from this participation factors we can determine which state having contributing which modes of oscillation modes of oscillation means i -th, we are talking about the i -th eigen vector eigen value so eigen value this what is the k -th, k -th is which state so what is the value of this will be the deciding how much it is contributing in that oscillation so this will give the information that which of the states are the problematic how much they are participating in that oscillation 
So, then knowing this information, we can propose, we can devise some of the controllers that will be useful for uh, uh, mitigating the oscillations or also improving the stability of the system as well. So, uh, now this let us come, these are the theory behind the dynamic uh, stability or is it small signal stability. Now, we can go move ahead to see how we can go for this HB ACDC system and we can determine the dynamic stability. First, uh, this equation that is a classical model as uh, you know the single equation already I defined many times. Here that we can write in the per unit torque or per unit power, we can write this the uh, swing equation having some damping constant the kd and that can be written in this form that is equation 12. Now, since we are going to analyze the small signal stability, then we have to linearize this equation because this is the equation of machine and again it is a classical because we have considered so many things, so many assumptions are there and based on that it is written. So, it is not a detailed modeling of the synchronous machine. But if you are going for the detail, then you have to go for writing the detailed differential equations. So, that we will see in the next slides. Here the equation number 12 will be linearized and then you can say linearize, we can get this equation. So, after getting this equation, you can say you are having the first order differential equation that is omega, uh, this del omega r and then you are having another that is equation of del delta with respect to time. So, we are having it since it is a second order differential equation, you will have the two differential equations as first order two differential equation and that can be linearized around the equilibrium point and thus we are having the linearized equations here that is equation 13 and 14 and that 13 and 14 can be even though using the Laplace transform or we can have the block diagram and we can have this block diagram you can see. Using those K s, K d, 2 h s and omega s all these values are here the calculated you can see. Now, here you can see this is a change in the torque looking at this equation. Uh, linearized model of synchronous machine. This is a classical model I can say. So, here the T m is your input and now you can see this is your the damping uh, torque coefficient the k d is coming the omega term here you can see that we can write from here this omega r this term is going there sorry and then we are just uh, integrating this we are getting delta and this delta is coming to the k s term is also coming that is synchronizing torque. So, you can see the k s is the synchronizing torque coefficient in the per unit, the k d is the damping torque coefficient, h is used nothing but it is the inertia constant, del omega r is the speed deviation in the per unit that is defined as omega r minus omega naught divided by omega naught, del delta is equal to the rotor angle deviation in the electrical radian, s is your Laplace factor and omega is the rated speed that is the 2 pi f. So, it is uh, here we can write and then we can the solvements we can write in terms of state space equations because you can see here it is a linearized equation. From there itself we can uh, this can give the correct equation of the second order with the two eigenvalues having undamped natural frequency the omega here that can be written the k s of omega is radian and the damping ratio can be also calculated in the similar fashion based on the calculating the eigenvalues. So, from that block diagram you can have this uh, you can form the state transition matrix A and then you can calculate the, uh, the uh, you can calculate this eigenvalues and after the eigenvalues you can calculate the damping as well as the natural omega frequency that you can calculate. So, uh, from there here means from the zeta we can draw few of the information here this omega n and the zeta you can see as the synchronizing torque coefficient k s increases the natural frequency increases because you can see if the k s increases omega n increases from the equation 12 uh, 15 and uh, the damping ratio decreases because you can see in the damping ratio here the k s is there if this is increasing this is going to decrease. However, an increase in the damping torque coefficient k d if here k d is increased you can say that increases the damping ratio that is very important. So, if your k d is higher the damping ratio is increasing and your the oscillations are damped quickly. Whereas, the increase in the inertia constant that is h decreases both omega n as well as your the zeta you can say here this h is in here. So, if you are having the more h it, it means that it decreases your damping here as well as your this h. So, these are the, the classical machine based on the classical machine theory and the linearized one we can draw these conclusions. 
Now, if you want to go for the flux decay model and other models as well, then the detail the Leonhard model of the single machine infinite bus can normally known as the Harfan Phillips model in that the linear model is derived considering the mechanical dynamics and one axis flux decays dynamics of the synchronous machine. And the model implies the six components k1 to k6 to relate the various quantities with the rotor angle deviation that is change in delta and the air gap flux linkage deviation that is change in the psi fd and that can be related here. So, you can say is a third order differential equation here we are having this is in s form you can say this is 1 s here also we can now this we can write here our this model this earlier the model it was here now we can have all these things as well means we are using this uh, the exciter we are using the voltage regulation so and field circuit measurement etcetera with reference to voltage so this is basically the detailed linear model and that is the, it is taken from the propulsion current control book this power system stability and control in this model all the constants assume the positive value except k phi so this k phi can become the negative and this will cause the damping coefficient to be negative and this happens when the external system reactance is higher and are the input of the generator is output of the generator is high. Uh, to calculate the K s and K d the find the expression for the change in the electrical with respect to your the change in your sigma that is your real value of eigen value then s is equal to j omega the real part is the K s and the imaginary part will be the K d. So, that can be calculated here. Now, we have to now come as a, as I said we can if you are going for the detailed modeling of the generator. So, then you have to write all this governing equations for the generators and your the power system and then you can linearize. Then we are coming for the DC system. So, your DC system requires again the differential equations then that should be linearized. So, the equations related to your the converter rectifier then here this side your inverter then you are having the DC system model already in the AC side I said you have to have the network model, you have to machine model all the models you have to include. Then you have to include the filters both side and then you are having the phase lock loop that is basically from the phi it is calculating the theta and this is basically nothing but this block diagram SVDC system is taken from the first bench mark model for the SVDC control studies basically normally also it is known as a cigarette bench model and that can be used each and each differential equations will be clubbed along with your other differential equations and the differential equations means that AC as well as DC and then you can solve. This phase lock loop you can say this is also it is a simple block is shown here, but it is also having some P i as well as 1 upon S. So, you can also relate here. So, based on this here we can write the various governing equations for this system as well means for your uh, for a DC system then along with the AC system we can linearize and we can just go for all your eigenvalues as well as you can go for the vectors and then you can see the participation of all the eigenvalues and then you can analyze the small signal stability of the system as well. So, uh, in this uh, lecture what uh, we did we just uh, I gave a brief introduction about the small signal stability in general. Then we just derive one the machine model and then the DC system as well and based on that you can calculate the eigenvalues having forming the state transition matrix and then you can relate and you can find whether your system is a stable or unstable or you can say go for the various analysis. Once you know system is unstable then you can also find which modes by analyzing the participation matrix you can analyze which one is the contributing and which one is the culprit for this. So, that can be done. So, with this I can basically end up this uh, module uh, module 6 and this is a lecture number 6. So, in this whole total module we had the 6 lectures including from very beginning that we had your this AC DC load flow then we had this your uh, transient stability and then also we have the dynamic stability. So, in this now this uh, end of uh, this uh, module 6 will next lecture will go for the module number 7 and in that we will go for the various diverse topics like the topic including your HBDC light means the HBDC having this your IGBDs. We also see your uh, multi terminal HBDC and also we will see the HBDC application for the wind and the renewable energy sources as well. So, with this I conclude my this uh, my end, uh, the module 6 and the lecture. Thank you.